afternoon. The first item of business today is portfolio questions, and we start with question number one from Tom Mason. Thank you, presiding officer. I ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to reduce the number of children living in material deprivation. Thank you very much. Cabinet Secretary Angela Constance. Thank you, President Officer. Through the Child Poverty Scotland Bill, we are setting ambitious targets to reduce the numbers of children living in material deprivation. Our action to meet these targets will be outlined within the delivery plans due under the Bill, the first of which will be published by April 2018. The plan will be influenced by a programme of engagement with key stakeholders and interest groups and by the formal advice I have requested from the Poverty and Inequality Commission. The scale of the challenge is of course significant and all the more so uh, in the face of the ongoing UK Government programme of welfare reform. The first delivery plan will be underpinned by our new Tackling Child Poverty Fund worth £50 million. This is alongside the range of measures we already uh, undertake, such as almost doubling uh, funded provision of early learning and childcare by 2020, providing free school meals to primary uh, one to three pupils, and providing a baby box of essential items uh, to give every child the best possible start. And the bill also places focus on local action uh, with reporting for local authorities and health boards. And we recently published uh, experimental statistics to help inform local need. Tom Mason. And Mr Mason, could you just pull your microphone just so it's pointing straight at you? That's it. Thank you. I thank the members for that, that response. The Children and Families with Limited Resources Across Scotland report published last week highlights that the 20% of children in Scotland live in combined low income and material deprivation. The most likely characteristic to impact children and ensure that they live in families with limited resources is worklessness, with 66.7% of workless families have, have children living with limited resources. This key finding reinforces the position of the Scottish Conservatives that one of the important elements to combating child poverty is to reduce the number of, the number of workless households. Action taken by the UK Government has caused the percentage of workless households across the UK to fall to record level lows. However, progress persistently remains slower in Scotland. Will the Minister acknowledge that the Scottish Government should be targeting its resources on reducing the number of workless households in Scotland in order to combat child poverty? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, it's uh, perhaps unfortunate that the member wasn't paying, by the sounds of it, an awful lot of attention when we had the debate uh, only a few weeks ago uh, and unanimously passed uh, the Child Poverty Bill in this uh, Parliament, uh, where uh, there is a, a, an agreement uh, that uh, statutory income targets are absolutely uh, vital. Uh, but we also agree across this chamber, or at least uh, I thought we did, that there are, of course, uh, a wide range of causes and consequences uh, that drive uh, child poverty. And, of course, what the member fails uh, to mention is that families in work and experiencing poverty uh, is indeed uh, on the rise. Uh, and in essence, there are three very broad drivers uh, of child poverty, uh, cuts uh, to social security uh, and support uh, to low income families, uh, and indeed uh, income from employment is another important driver and that's why I'm pleased that Scotland uh, is the best uh, performing home nation in the UK uh, with around 8% uh, uh, of, of people earning at least uh, the, 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 living, the living wage and of course the cost of living is another important uh, driver for pushing families into poverty. Julian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. Has the Cabinet Secretary done an assessment on the impact of the austerity and welfare reform policies of the Tory-led UK Government on child poverty in Scotland? And is the Scottish Government getting any increased funding as a result of the savings to the UK Treasury as a result of these austerity policies, which take money directly from the poorest households? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, the Scottish Government uh, published a report earlier this year, I think in June, uh, setting out the research and the evidence uh, in terms of the impact in Scotland uh, of Tory austerity and welfare cuts in particular. Uh, we know, and many of our uh, stakeholders would concur with our assessment, that by the end of this decade, uh, £4 billion will be taken out of welfare support uh, in Scotland, and that will, of course, uh, have the biggest impact uh, on those uh, most 
uh, in, in need. Uh, meanwhile, uh, you know, this government will continue to do everything we can with the, the powers uh, and the resources that we have at our disposal. As I outlined in my uh, earlier uh, response, uh, while the challenge is great, while the challenge to eradicate child poverty is made harder due to the actions or inactions uh, of the UK government, uh, nonetheless, we are determined to proceed uh, in Scotland and move forward on the first step uh, following the passage uh, of our legislation will indeed be to introduce uh, the, the cross-government, cross-cut and delivery plan. Polly McNeill. Thank you. In Glasgow, 3,500 families are eligible for free school meals, but they don't claim them. What can the Scottish Government do to improve the take-up and will they work with local authorities to ensure that more families benefit from free school meals? Secretary. Absolutely, I think it's a very important point. Uh, we have a, a range of actions uh, across the government about improving information uh, to people on the basis of what they are entitled uh, to receive or entitled uh, to uh, apply for. Uh, Minister Jean Freeman has led uh, a lot of that activity around uh, a benefits, uh, welfare benefits uh, campaign take up. Uh, there are other actions that, are, of course, are, are far more uh, targeted, and we do indeed uh, work hand and glove and as we proceed uh, with our delivery plan and our journey towards eradicating child poverty we will have to work uh, very closely with partners locally uh, to find better ways uh, to help families uh, actually achieve quickly uh, and receive quickly the support that they, they are indeed entitled to receive. Question two, John Scott. The presiding officer to ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions the Minister for local government and housing has had with councils regarding the sustainability of services. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, ministers and uh, officials regularly meet representatives of all Scottish local authorities to discuss uh, a range of issues as part of our commitment to working in partnership with local government to improve outcomes uh, for all of the people of Scotland. My colleague, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance and the Cost Constitution, has met a number of individual councils and is currently undertaking a series of meetings with COSLA ahead of his 2018-19 draft budget, uh, budget announcement next week, which will include the local government finance settlement for next year. John Scott. I thank the Minister for his answer. Um, he will be aware of the Scottish Housing Condition Survey in 2015 highlighted that 8% of our housing stock is in extensive disrepair, 33% is in disrepair and requiring urgent attention, and 73% of all dwellings have a degree of disrepair. What assessments has the Scottish Government made of local authorities' abilities to fund and repair their deteriorating properties, and what funding has the Scottish Government made available to local authorities to address this growing problem? Minister. Uh, local authorities uh, manage their own housing budgets through their housing revenue accounts, uh, presiding officer. Uh, beyond that, the member will be aware that in terms of uh, affordable housing, this government is committed to £3 billion of investment over the course of this parliament uh, to uh, deliver 50,000 affordable homes, 35,000 of those for social rent. Uh, of course, budgets uh, would be much easier for all of us to deal with if it weren't for the fact uh, that the Tories uh, will cut this uh, uh, Parliament's budget by £500 million over the next two years. Uh, those are the Fraser of Allender Institute figures, uh, not the government's figures. Uh, what we see from the Tories is this constant carping on about spend, but the reality of Tory policy is that that Tory agenda of cuts to public services, austerity for the poor, and tax cuts for the rich. I wish that Mr Scott would talk to the Chancellor of the Exchequer to ask for an end to those policies. Richard Lyle. Tara thought Mr Scott would have known that the housing budget was entirely separate from the uh, revenue budget. I was a councillor for 36 years. I knew that. Can the minister confirm whether, it is, whether or not it is the case that in 2017-18 local government finance settlement, including the increase in council tax and health and social care integration funding, means that local government have an extra £383 million, or 3.7%, in support for services compared to 2016-17. Minister. 
Uh, Mr uh, Lyle, of course, is very aware of uh, housing revenue accounts uh, and how councils spend uh, from them. Uh, it's just a pity that the Tory benches uh, don't seem to be aware of that situation. Uh, presiding officer, they may snicker from the sidelines, but they would do well to do a little bit of homework when it comes to local government finance. Uh, Mr Lyle is absolutely right. Um, taken with uh, all of the measures that were put in place, council tax reform, health and social care integration uh, and others uh, 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 monies, that amount came to £383 million extra for local services last year. Uh, an additional £21 million would have been available for local services if uh, eight Labour-led councils had actually chosen to uh, increase the council tax revenues. Uh, but those uh, Labour councils chose not to do so. Those councils being Labour-run Aberdeen, South Lanarkshire, Renfrewshire, Inverclyde, North Lanarkshire, Stirling, Western Bartonshire and West Lothian. It will be interesting to see how these councils react uh, this time round. James Kelly. Uh, thank you. In terms of local government, I'm surprised that the Minister didn't reference the recent COSLA report demonstrating how much the SNP government had penalised local government, resulting in cumulatively £1.4 billion of cuts and 15,000 job losses. In terms, of the coming, in terms of the coming budget, can I ask the Minister, uh, is this government finally going to get off the fence, use the powers of this Parliament take some responsibility to promote progressive taxation and give local government the fair funding settlement that they deserve. Minister. Uh, Mr Kelly, uh, his question is a bit bizarre in some regards because I would have thought that he would have been pointing the figure, finger very firmly at the Tory Treasury uh, and their austerity policies which have led to massive budget cuts over the piece uh, for this Parliament. Uh, in real terms, over the period of 2010 to 17, local government's share of the Scottish budget has stayed the same. Uh, that is the case, stayed the same. Over the period of 2016 to 18, uh, local government's uh, share of the budget fell by just 0.2%. However, uh, you know, I think that uh, Mr. Kelly and his colleagues, I can hear Miss Bailey very loudly from the sidelines, they should go and have a look at what has happened south of the border in terms of local government funding, where some councils have faced 40% worth of cuts under Tory rule. Question number three, Lewis MacDonald. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how it will ensure that planning law provides adequate protection for live music venues. Minister Kevin Stewart. Officer, I'm committed to exploring the agent of change principle uh, and how it could be embedded into our planning system so that we can protect the established and emerging talent in our music industry. Uh, we're currently exploring some options and we'll continue to engage closely with our stakeholders, including the music industry, in developing the best proposals. I'll be happy to bring forward amendments to the planning bill if I conclude that that is the right approach. Lewis thank, you, I thank the Minister for that reply and I welcome his willingness to explore and engage with the principle of agent of change. He has of course made the point previously that live music venues can be unfairly jeopardised in ways that the agent of ch uh, change principle does not entirely prevent and he will know that that is why the Welsh Government is also planning to give local councils the power to designate areas of cultural significance for music. Uh, in order to provide an additional level of protection uh, in particular areas. Will the Minister consider, when he's exploring these matters, uh, introducing such a power for Scottish local authorities? Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and I thank uh, Mr Macdonald for uh, his question, and um, I would applaud him for uh, constructively ag engaging on this issue, uh, as, has, uh, as have other members, including Tom Arthur uh, and the Cabinet Secretary uh, for Culture, Fiona Hislop, who is a, a very close interest in this matter. Um, I fully intend to uh, meet uh, with the music, Musicians' Union very shortly, um, and I will continue to liaise with the Cabinet Secretary for Culture to see if there are other, any other issues that we need to think of uh, in, in terms of dealing with this situation. 
um, I can assure uh, Mr Macdonald that I will go and look and see what the Welsh Government are undertaking. Uh, we'll have a, a, a conversation with the Cabinet Secretary for Culture uh, and Mr Macdonald can be assured that I will continue uh, to keep him appraised of what we're doing in this regard. Uh, Mr Gibson, are you wanting in on this? No, it was a previous no. question I was trying to come in on. Uh, uh, thank you. Rachel, sorry, Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, may I bring the Minister's attention to the course of action taken by the UK Government as well, which ensures that noise impacts must be properly factored in by planning authorities in cases where developers at attempt to turn offices into residential accommodation uh, to be appropriate? And will it follow suit and show support for live music venues, as does the UK Government? Minister. Well, I'm unaware of any proposals by the UK government to introduce agent, uh, uh, the Agent for Change principle. Um, as I outlined in my answer to Mr Macdonald, I'm aware of uh, the moves that the Welsh government are, try are trying to undertake. I'm aware uh, that Sadiq Khan, the Mayor of London, um, is also looking at this in terms of the next London plan uh, and that the state of Victoria and Australia has already changed its planning policy. I am unaware uh, of any UK government proposals in this regard, uh, but I'll certainly look and see uh, what they're up to uh, in this area of business. Question number four, Ruth McGuire. To ask the Scottish Government to provide an update on the work of the Homelessness and Rough Sleeping Action Group. Minister Kevin Stewart. Uh, I'm pleased to say that the Homelessness and Rough Sleeping Action Group, which was set up in October, has moved quickly to recommend actions to minimise rough sleeping this winter. Last week, the First Minister announced that the Scottish Government accepted all of these recommendations and we're moving rapidly to implementation, backed with a total fu funding package of £328,000, including £262,000 from the Scottish Government. These actions will increase emergency accommodation and outreach provision for people at risk of rough sleeping and will be crucial to supporting and protecting people this winter. The Action Group have also started work to identify what needs to be done to achieve long-term sustainable solutions to end rough sleeping for good and to transform temporary accommodation. I'd like to thank the Action Group for their work to date and look forward to receiving their future recommendations. Ruth McGuire. Thank you. I'd warmly welcome that answer, in particular the additional funding. Does the Minister agree, however, that the long-term focus of the Action Group needs to be as it is on sustainable solutions which prevent people rough sleeping in the first place? And will he confirm that its focus is now on, look now on looking at practical and systems changes needed to end rough sleeping for good? Minister. Uh, yes, I completely agree with uh, Ms McGuire. Uh, we asked the Action Group to move quickly to identify actions that can make a real direct different difference for people at risk uh, of sleeping rough this winter. And we know uh, that some of the actions needed to help people right now at the point of crisis, such as expanding winter care shelter provision, are not the right answers uh, for the long term. Uh, this does not mean that they are not the right thing to do here and now for those at immediate risk of rough sleeping. But this is just the start of the work required to meet our shared ambitions. Uh, the Action Group have already begun work on the longer term questions that we set them of ending rough sleeping for good, uh, transforming the use of temporary accommodation uh, and moving towards ending homelessness. Uh, the Government is committed to tackling and preventing homelessness and we look forward to the forthcoming recommendations on the longer term action needed. Adam Tompkins. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm glad the Minister is talking about the longer term as well as immediate actions. According to Homeless Action uh, Scotland, one of the main reasons for rough sleeping in Glasgow is relationship breakdown or family breakdown. What action is the Scottish Government taking to mitigate the impact of this problem? Minister. Um, relationship breakdown is one aspect of homelessness, uh, but one of the uh, things that uh, is causing much more grief out there at this moment in time uh, is Tory austerity and social security cuts. Um, and don't take my word for it, President Officer. Uh, the National Audit Office assessment uh, uh, that uh, uh, was scathing 
of, of the UK government. Um, it says that the number of homeless families in the UK has risen by more than 60% and that that is likely to have been driven by the UK government's welfare reforms and uh, the National Audit Office accused the Tory government of having a light touch approach to tackling the problem. Uh, and we, uh, we in Scotland have taken a, a different approach. Uh, we are investing in trying to resolve these difficulties uh, while the Tories are actually adding to the woes and are creating even more difficulties for the most vulnerable people in our society. They should hang their heads in shame, President Officer. Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. If I could maybe bring it back to the recommendations that have just been published, can I welcome them and also note they, they do have a focus on reducing uh, rough sleeping this winter. And I note that under other considerations, wellbeing is mentioned. So could the Minister advise us how health fits in here and specifically the health needs of women who are sleeping rough, including access in medicines and indeed sanitary products? Minister. Um, I thank uh, Ms Smith for that uh, question, uh, President Officer, and I'm always happy to engage with Ms Smith on, this, on these issues. Uh, I know that she takes a, a great interest. Uh, one of the things, one of the recommendations um, that have, has been made in ex uh, by the Action Group and accepted by the government um, is personal budgets to deal with the individual needs of people. I have to say that I was horrified to read uh, the press reports the other uh, week of uh, a woman being forced to use leaves um, because she had no access to um, sanitary products. Um, I would hope that personal budgets could be used in that regard uh, over the course of this winter. I think that uh, as we move forward, the Action Group are going to look in more depth at how personal budgets can be used uh, for a number of things, including um, uh, sanitary products and other uh, hygiene products. Uh, and I hope uh, that the, uh, the monies that has been allocated in terms of budgets will go a long way in, in trying to resolve some of these horrific situations uh, that have been reported of late. Question number five, James Kelly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what guidance it can provide to properties affected by alumin aluminium composite material cladding. Minister Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, we have directed owners and local authorities to guidance and advice issued by the UK Government on steps that should be taken by owners of properties that might have aluminium composite material uh, on them. Uh, this guidance is applicable in Scotland and includes steps to have the material tested, commissioning an independent fire safety assessment, as well as information on large-scale fire tests, which will help owners understand what materials are on their buildings need replacing to reduce uh, the fire risk. I must stress that an independent fire safety assessment is key to determining any course of action, as depending on the type of ACM, the extent of its coverage, the design of the overall cladding system, as well as other fire safety features, uh, there may be no need to take further action. James Kelly. Uh, I thank the, the Minister for that answer. Uh, the Minister will be aware that there are properties in Glasgow affected by ACM cladding and one of my constituents stays in, a, in an affected block. Despite it being approved at the time, it wouldn't currently gain planning permission. And consequently, the owners are being charged thousands of pounds to have a fire warden on patrol, and the replacement cladding would come in at between six and nine million pounds. Can the Scottish Government explain uh, what it's doing to help uh, worried property owners like my constituent? Minister. Uh, President Officer, I know that uh, Glasgow City Council are communicating uh, with the owners, uh, with the factors and with others uh, around about uh, the buildings that Mr Kelly has highlighted here today. Um, uh, buildings themselves primarily are the responsibility of owners. However, local authorities do have broad discretionary powers to provide assistance for work needed to bring any house into a reasonable state of 
repair. And they are best placed to make decisions about what assistance should be provided to meet local circumstances and priorities. However, I can give uh, Mr Kelly the assurance uh, that myself and my colleagues in the Ministerial Working Group, the Cabinet Secretary, Angela Constance, uh, and uh, Community Safety Minister, um, Annabel Ewing, will continue uh, to liaise with Glasgow to see exactly what the situation is. Question number six, James Dornan. To ask the Scottish Government what support it is giving to the campaign 16 Days of Activism Against Gender-Based Violence. Cabinet Secretary. Sign off. So the First Minister and I, along with many of our ministerial colleagues, have signed and uh, publicised a pledge to support 16 Days of Activism. This is an important period where we must reflect on progress made and the substantial contribution of activists and organisations in this area. But the 16 days also serves as an important reminder uh, that much remains to be done. And that is why uh, this government is taking action. So on the 24th of November, I launched a delivery plan for Equally Safe, Scotland's strategy to prevent and eradicate violence against women and girls, and backed this with over a million pounds of additional funding. And the plan contains 118 actions over four priorities. And with it, we hope to achieve a real step change in this area. And on the 28th of November last week, we held a parliamentary debate to mark the 16 days of activism. And in that, I called for men everywhere to stand shoulder to shoulder with women and sending a very clear message that violence against women and girls is never acceptable. And the strong cross-party consensus within this debate showed that tackling gender-based violence uh, is indeed everyone's business. James Dornan. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Can the Government set out what funding it is providing to tackle violence against women and ensure victims receive the support they need outside of that million pounds and how they expect higher education institutes to respond to the delivery plan? Cabinet Secretary. Signing off, sir, we are indeed investing at significant levels of funding to support a range of uh, very specialist uh, frontline services uh, to make sure that women affected by violence or abuse are able to access uh, the support when and where they need it. Uh, for this year alone, in terms of my own equalities portfolio, I've invested nearly uh, £12 uh, million, pounds, uh, and that supports the vital work of local women's aids organisations, uh, rape crisis centres uh, across uh, the country. And earlier this year, uh, I also introduced uh, three-year loan funding uh, for these services also. It is uh, vital to uh, allow and support these organisations to plan for the future, uh, enabling them to do uh, what we do best nationally. Uh, there, are there are two national helplines uh, which we invest in, and uh, my colleague, the Cabinet Secretary for Justice, has been uh, investing £20 million uh, over a three-year period uh, to strengthen the justice response uh, in this area also, uh, and indeed to increase uh, advocacy. In terms of the questions uh, around uh, higher education, I think this is a very important uh, issue raised uh, by uh, James Dornan. Uh, it is absolutely vital that our campuses and institutions uh, are safe spaces uh, for students uh, and any student experience violence uh, or abuse feels that they, one, are able to report it and, uh, secondly, that it will be dealt with uh, appropriately. And we are working uh, very hard with further and higher education institutions uh, to utilise the learning from Equally Safe uh, in higher education project uh, that ran at the University of Strathclyde uh, to ensure uh, the safety of students and to embed that, that better understanding of the issues. Annie Wells. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to address the disparities that can exist between rural and urban areas when it comes to service provision for victims of rape and sexual assault, particularly in relation to travel issues for forensic examination and access to specialist advocacy groups. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I appreciate uh, Ms Bell's interest uh, in this area. Um, I should um, I'd like to point out to Ms Wells that in terms of the work led by the Cabinet Secretary for uh, Justice, uh, through the resources in his portfolio, uh, additional funding uh, was uh, given to Rape Crisis Scotland uh, to ensure an additional advocacy uh, worker within every uh, project, uh, the length and breadth of Scotland. Uh, there are also, uh, as a result of work led by Michael Matheson, uh, improved services uh, in the Northern Isles that was uh, announced uh, uh, earlier on this year. Uh, there is other work in terms of um, the task force uh, chaired by the chief medical officer uh, that is indeed um, really getting into the detail 
uh, and the very sensitive issues around forensic services uh, to ensure that we uh, can implement the highest of standards uh, in terms of care, support and treatment uh, for women and victims uh, the entire length and breadth of Scotland, irrespective of where they live, whether that's uh, in an urban or indeed a rural community. I think people uh, have the absolutely right to expect uh, in this regard the same standards applying across Scotland. Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that in nine out of ten domestic abuse uh, cases that there is a financial element to, to that abuse, which is precisely why we are pleased that the Government have supported the use um, of split payments of universal credit to both partners. Can a Cabinet Secretary say uh, whether she or the, the Minister will lodge regulations to deliver split payments well ahead of the second reading of the Universal Credit Application Advice and Assistance Bill in March and deliver automatic split, pay split payments in Scotland? Uh, again, President Officer, Mr Griffin, uh, as a member of this Parliament, raises uh, a very important issue. Uh, both Ms Freeman uh, and myself have heard uh, from stakeholders uh, the potential contribution that split payments uh, could make to women living in very controlling and coercive uh, circumstances. It is an area that we want to take some care with, ensuring that the implementation, uh, because it is our desire to uh, deliver split payments, but we want to ensure that we get the implementation uh, absolutely uh, correct uh, and we are still um, in, the, in, in the depths of the detail of the discussions around that to ensure that we get that right but I'm sure uh, that Ms Freeman um, at the earliest possible opportunity will want to update members uh, and indeed the, the Social Security Committee. Question number seven, Adam Tompkins. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it's making in developing the delivery plan to, to tackle child poverty. Cabinet Secretary. Signing off, so the first delivery plan required by the Child Poverty Scotland Bill is due by April 2018. It will make a comprehensive statement of cross-government actions uh, to make significant progress towards the ambitious targets set out in the Bill. Uh, a programme of external engagement is underway, including key stakeholders <coughs> and interest groups uh, and those with direct experience of poverty. A formal request for advice has been issued to the Poverty and Inequality Commission and I will write shortly to conveners of all relevant subject matter committees uh, within the Scottish Parliament to seek their views on priorities and actions for the delivery plan. Uh, as we know, the Institute for Fiscal Studies has uh, projected that an additional 1.3 million children will be in relative poverty uh, in the UK uh, by 2021-22 uh, compared to 2015-16. Clearly, this makes the scale of the challenge associated with the development of child poverty delivery plan uh, all the more stark, uh, particularly in the face of the, the UK ongoing programme of austerity and welfare cuts. Adam Tompkins. Cabinet Secretary for that serious answer to a serious question. I was beginning to wonder, presiding officer, if there was a misprint in the business bulletin, because it says here portfolio questions, not Kevin Stewart's pantomime. But let me see if I can elicit another serious answer. Let me see if I can elicit another serious answer from the now frowning Cabinet Secretary. The recently published uh, Joseph Rowntree Foundation briefing on poverty in Scotland 2017 says, and I quote, that the biggest driver of future poverty is the educational attainment of children when they leave full-time education, unquote. What will the delivery plan say, Cabinet Secretary, about the action that the Scottish Government is taking to close the attainment gap? Cabinet Secretary. So, you know, officer, um, I can assure Mr uh, Tomkins and uh, the rest of Chamber that the delivery plan uh, will indeed um, account and articulate for the action that, that we are and will take uh, in terms of closing uh, the poverty-related uh, education gra gap. But in terms of the, the, the Joseph Rowntree uh, Foundation, their most recent report, we always welcome uh, the work of Joseph Rowntree Foundation. It is always uh, very in-depth and indeed uh, very uh, thoughtful. Um, of course, my uh, recollection of Joseph Rowntree Foundation um, is that uh, they describe uh, the benefits freeze, uh, for example, as the single biggest policy driver uh, behind uh, rising poverty, uh, hitting families uh, in and out of work. And the other issues uh, raised by Joseph Rowntree Foundation, and I don't, I don't say this to take any comfort because it is uh, a serious matter and while it reflects 
uh, that Scotland generally has lower poverty uh, than elsewhere than the UK. Um, I think that speaks to the progress that this Parliament has made in a, a number of, of cross-cutting areas. But of course, we all know uh, the reality of day-to-day -day life is that poverty uh, remains too high in Scotland and indeed uh, is projected to rise. So the importance of our Poverty and Inequality Commission in the advice that they will give ministers uh, and indeed uh, more broadly to Civic Scotland is very uh, important. And that contrasts sharply uh, with the position south of the border where the UK Social Mobility Commission uh, has resigned uh, en masse. And I think that's a very sorry state of affairs uh, for uh, the UK government. And indeed, uh, I have written to them uh, on that matter uh, because Alan Milburn and others uh, have resigned from that commission uh, due to the, the, the lack of conviction uh, by the UK government uh, in addressing matters in and around poverty and inequality and uh, social mobility. But we are absolutely serious uh, that our delivery plan will indeed address issues uh, of educational attainment, but it will be absolutely uh, broader than that uh, tapping into the talent and expertise of people like Joseph Rowntree Foundation, but we need to be looking at um, issues uh, about the living wage, uh, in and around uh, housing as well, uh, the rising cost of living uh, for families, uh, and indeed uh, how we support uh, the very poorest of families uh, to achieve a better standard of living. Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with research presented to this Parliament by the University of Sheffield that the loss of £4 billion in benefit income has weakened some of Scotland's poorest economies and cost them more than 10,000 jobs following welfare reform, delivering exactly the opposite outcome the Tories claim to advocate, i.e. a reduction in child poverty? Cabinet Secretary. So, you know, sir, I think that the stark facts, as we've debated and discussed many times uh, in this Parliament, uh, backed up uh, again and again, whether it's by uh, the research that Mr Gibson reports, uh, whether it's by the, the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, which we all um, quote from um, liberally, uh, whether it's the work from the, the Institute of Fiscal Studies, that it all demonstrates that the, the work that the UK government is doing is counterproductive to tackling child poverty in this country, where by the end of this decade, there will be a million more children across uh, the UK uh, living in poverty. And the Joseph Rowntree Foundation uh, are absolutely right. And while they point to the progress that we have made in Scotland, they are right to point to the fragility uh, of that progress as a result of UK uh, austerity and so-called welfare reforms. Question number eight, Graham Simpson. To ask the Scottish Government what progress has been made to end rough sleeping this winter. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. As I said earlier, the Scottish Government has accepted the recommendations of the Homelessness and Rough Sleeping Action Group to reduce rough sleeping this winter. Uh, we have accepted those recommendations and are providing £262,000 of funding to support rapid implementation of these actions. Actions were prioritised on the basis of the ability to implement at speed and to ensure potential for direct and biggest impact focused on our main cities. These actions will be crucial to supporting and protecting people with nowhere safe and warm to sleep this winter. Ending rough sleeping is a national priority for this government and that is why the Action Group have also been tasked with bringing forward recommendations for the government to, ta to take to eradicate rough sleeping for good. Graeme Simpson. Thank you. Um, and I agree with the Minister that we need a, a long-term uh, approach to this. However, the initial target of minimising rough sleeping uh, this winter is too woolly to mean anything. It allows the government to claim any reduction as a success. So could I ask the Minister what, in terms of numbers or percentages, would he regard as a success? Minister. Uh, President officer, uh, one person rough sleeping in the streets is one too many uh, in my book. Uh, and the job uh, that we have uh, tasked the action group with was to come up with that recommendations and to provide us uh, with uh, their recommendations as what we need to do this winter to do that we, the best that we possibly can for those most vulnerable people in our society. They have done so. 
Uh, we have accepted all of their recommendations. Uh, we have come up with the finance and the resource uh, to deal with those recommendations. Uh, and now the job is to get on with doing the best that we possibly can to help all of those folks, uh, those most vulnerable in our society. Question number nine, Richard Lockhead. Can I ask the Scottish Government what response it received to representations it made to the UK Government regarding the location of PIP assessment centres and the impact this has had on claimants in Murray? Minister Jean Freeman. Thank you. I know that the member has written to the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, David Gock, last month on this issue. For too many, the PIP assessment is already a stressful experience and I fully agree that it is not acceptable to compound that with a requirement to travel in the case that Mr uh, Lockhead raises of a round trip of about 100 miles with the additional difficulty that that involves. He will be aware that we have repeatedly called on the UK government to halt the rollout of PIP in Scotland. The rollout has been beset by delays. Many people have had to go under, undergo stressful assessments and many have lost entitlement, including access to the motability scheme and link support to carers allowance and, and other benefits with devastating consequences. Richard Lockhead. I find it difficult to express the distress that some of my constituents have been put through, given that sometimes people find it uncomfortable leaving their home or travelling anywhere, never mind to Inverness, for a PIP assessment which may determine their income for the foreseeable future. And I have had a response from Michael Hughes, the Chief the Client Executive of Independent uh, Assessment Services, who told me in response to my concerns, we're now going to reduce the number of people who have to travel to Inverness for their assessments and they instead will be offered home consultations. But does the Minister not agree that the answer here is for Murray to have its own assessment centre full stop, given the distress that that, that journey is causing? And I've heard of people taking time off their work to help people at their own expense go through to these assessments, given the distress it causes. Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I, I thank the member for that supplementary question. Now, I'm, of course, pleased that, uh, as a result of Mr Lockhead's representation, the situation in his constituency may be uh, alleviated. However, of considerable concern to me is that the DWP have confirmed that they don't even trouble to know how many people across the country are affected in the way that Mr Lockhead has outlined. Minimising stress, and that includes conducting ass assessments at home where, or where the appropriate or as close to home as possible, is exactly the route that should uh, be gone down. And I agree with Mr Lockhead that an assessment centre in Murray, for as long as the DWP continue to have responsibility for this benefit, uh, would be the right way to go. However, of course, we will not be going down that route. Uh, we will not be using private contractors to conduct assessments, and I'm particularly pleased at that, given that on Monday the DWP statistics show that by their own quality standards, uh, very few of their contractors met those standards over a considerable period of time, indeed since January 2014. And that we will reduce the number of assessments that are needed using evidence at first decision in order to minimise that approach and where it is necessary provide locally based assessments in an individual's own home or in local premises conducted by those with experience uh, for the condition to which it is being assessed. So the long term answer to this is of course for Scotland to have control of social security. Thank you. And that, <clears throat> that concludes portfolio questions. We'll move on to Liberal Democrat Business on Justice. We'll just take a few moments for members to change seats.